Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Navratel. I'm a political science professor and the Democracy Commitment Coordinator at Moraine Valley. Thank you for joining us today in our debut of our YouTube Live system here in the library. This is the first time in about two and a half years that we've hosted a live event in the library. Uh, today's event is examining the war at six months. I want to thank Troy Swanson and the library for hosting us, getting us back to normal here in the library and, and hosting live events. Um, so look forward to a conversation today about looking at the war in, in Ukraine at the six month mark. I'm joined today by my colleagues uh, to my left, uh, Jason King. He is a professor of developmental math and geography. And Jim McIntyre, a history professor, and Josh Fulton, a history professor. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise today, my friends. Thank you for inviting us, Kevin. Uh, to start off with, I, I thought it'd be good to kind of take stock of where we're at. Um, for those of you who haven't been following very closely, there's been thousands of deaths in Ukraine in the war so far. It's been tough to get um, good estimates. Um, a lot of different numbers have been thrown out there by um, different organizations and sides. But um, at least tens of thousands so far have, have been killed. And um, millions have been displaced. So it's a very tragic situation in Ukraine. But yet, I think it's unfolded in a lot of ways that has surprised many people. So to start off with, I thought it'd be good to, to ask each of our panel members what has surprised them the most um, at the six month mark of the war in Ukraine. Jason? I guess what surprised me the most is just how wrong everybody got it. Um, the international relations community had I had looked through and I tried to find as many international relations specialists that I could find that weighed in on it. And I found essentially two that would any way, shape, or form be considered that. I found Mitt Romney and John Mearsheimer, uh, former U.S. general, that both said that a war with Russia, between Russia and Ukraine was possible. Pretty much everybody else dismissed the idea. And I myself thought, no, there's no possible way. I'm seven tiers below them probably as far as like what my thoughts are but just how wrong we all were on that and looking back on it i kind of took a look and see it so like is there any way that we could have seen any better and lo and behold i started looking and yeah you know if you look at who putin was listening to um alexander dugin he had been pushing for war in ukraine for a long time or even the way that he referred to Ukraine. Uh, Putin, when he refers to Ukraine, he refers to it in a way in Russian that suggests that it's not a nation and has never been a nation. It's V versus Na if you speak Russian. Um, all sorts of little things. His speeches talked about how Ukraine wasn't a legitimate nation, never was, how it was Lenin's tragedy that he created this Soviet Socialist Republic out of nothing, essentially. I guess that'd be the biggest surprise to me is just it, it's a good reminder for me just that we're all wrong sometimes about this sort of stuff, I guess. Well, and to build on that, I would say how wrong everyone got the, the Ukraine's ability to resist, right? The duration of this thing, because NSA was giving out estimates of two weeks max. And here we are at the six month mark, you know? And and so a lot of a lot of experts who are supposed to be reporting to policymakers have definitely been also eating some humble pie for six months. Um, and now no one's really projecting estimates. Every, everything is, you know, I've noticed also in over the duration, just the number of caveats that are added to any estimate. Well, if this and if that, then maybe. Um, so I, I think just um, most of us are also surprised by Ukraine's ability to maintain res the resistance, even with the sort of heavy influx of NATO hardware and foreign fighters on Ukraine side as well. I, in terms of things that surprise me or, or things that I've noticed to build on what both of my colleagues have said, um, you know, the maybe it doesn't surprise me, but it never ceases to amaze me, would be the just continued level of, of corruption within the Russian defense industry. Uh, and the, uh, you know, although there has been a clear desire to reform for decades, uh, the clear inability to do so 
and the clear ineffectiveness uh, of, of the, the Russian military uh, uh, on a grand scale. Uh, you know, the amount of casualties they've taken, the, you know, coupled with, as uh, Professor McIntyre was saying, the, you know, m marvel of the ability of Ukraine to resist in the effective manner that, you know, as Professor King said, no one anticipated in this way, um, you know, ha has left us in a very interesting sort of situation, uh, which although, um, you know, I think the news today is saying that maybe an offensive, another offensive is beginning, uh, mm -hmm. that the, the large sort of stabilization of the front is, is, is kind of a fascinating thing to be able to watch. Yeah, I would, I would uh, echo those comments, both of uh, the previous comments about just being surprised that it's, it's been six months and we're in the situation that we're in. Uh, with Ukraine really being effective at fighting off uh, a major uh, world power, uh, one of the biggest militaries in the world. Um, their national unity that they've displayed, um, their determination, their fighting morale has, has really been amazing uh, and, and successful. Uh, the, the dedication of the civilians to endure what they've endured for this long um, I also just uh, spin it a little bit and maybe the international community of uh, the, the way that uh, NATO has been strengthened and European Union has been strengthened and um, the, the way that uh, some countries like Germany have increased their military spending and uh, so much aid and cooperation uh, amongst states. And I don't know that um, Putin really envisioned that level of coordination amongst uh, Western allies. So we're gonna take questions uh, as they come, so feel free to raise your hand and we have a microphone that can come around. Oh, um, I'm just, I'm curious, I haven't been following it very closely, but like what is like, what has been like the major like offensives as of late? And like the major, has there been any like pushback or anything from either side? Have they advanced, has the, has the Russians advanced anymore? I'm not, I'm not very caught, well caught, versed in that, <laughs> to be honest. From what I was reading today, at least, around the Kyrgyzstan Oblast, that there seems to be a Ukrainian offensive underway uh, that has made some initial gains. Uh, at least that's what the reporting from the Kiev Independent, Independent uh, and a few other outlets were reporting as of about 20 minutes ago. Uh, so we'll see kind of where that takes us and where it, where it goes. Uh, if they're able to consolidate some initial gains that they were apparently making. Uh, but, you know, large, and there has been, in the press at least, um, sort of this coverage of a, you know, hoped for Ukrainian counteroffensive, this idea of a sort of larger counteroffensive to take place at some point in the fall. Uh, is this it? Well, we'll see. It sounds like Russians have been pushed back to Nova Kahodka, which is about 20 miles east, still on the Niepa River, which is where Kherson is. In some ways, it might be a strategic fallback because in the beginning, Russia had tried to advance on three sides, in the north, in the east, in the south. And right now, it seems like all the forces in the north have been moved away from there towards the east and towards the south. And I guess maybe I'll talk about it later as far as what I think Russian strategic objectives might be in doing that, but it's certainly not good. In the beginning, the thought was, was that Putin probably wanted to take over the whole country and put one of his people in power, Dmitry Medvedchuk, great name, uh, bear, bear man, Medved in, in Russian. Since then, he's been arrested, and there's really no thoughts that Russia's attempting to take over the whole country anymore, let alone Kiev. So, but we don't know. <laughs> and, I, and I think one of the things you need to keep in mind is because of the weapons that NATO has sent in, the Russians have actually had to fall back even within the Russian borders. Like they, they're no longer stationing troop reserves and supply depots anywhere near Ukraine's border, which when you look at the, the strategic sort of balance between the two states, that's a big loss for Russia there as well. And I mean, a lot of the reports that I've been seeing, um, even since midsummer, if not before, uh, morale in the Russian army is really weak. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah I mean, you, you've had generals who basically 
walked into the front lines essentially committing suicide by Ukraine rather than deal with the backlash back home. How many generals is that have been killed in, in the Ukrainian war right now? I think it's like two dozen. Yeah. Some incredibly high number. So again, feel free to raise your hand if there's questions or comments uh, throughout our, our time today. Um, what do you think the significance of the war in Ukraine is so far, um, global implications or any others? Well, Kevin, I, as you already mentioned, um, it's thrown, a, it's, it's really boomeranged on Putin. His, it strengthened NATO, which um, was something that he certainly didn't expect, I think. I, I don't think he expected that, and I certainly don't think he wants it. Um, it's also made a lot of Russia's neighbors quite wary. Uh, clearly, Estonia has been making moves recently to ensure that, that they're, they're aware if they're next on the list. Um, as some, some of you might have seen, uh, they've been re removing Soviet-era monuments. Um, they've also recently closed their border. There's, there's a large Russian-speaking population in Estonia, and they're no longer allowing them to travel out of us. It, it, since the war started, you could not leave Russia for Western Europe directly. But what people would do would be go to Estonia and then leave via Estonia to get to the West. Well, they're now clamping down on those sorts of things. So they're, they're really preparing should Putin turn his attention their way. Um, so I think that just the, the reaction of the international community um, and the European community specifically has been a surprise. Um, I feel like I've seen like the um, the news coverage fizzle, fizzle out pretty quickly. Do any of you have any ideas as to why it was like so great back in when was that? February, yeah. February, March, and then all of a sudden it's kind of just, I haven't seen anything about it at all on any mainstream news. I follow a bunch of them on Instagram, and I've been seeing, you know, like on CNN I saw a, uh, a story of an emotional support alligator, <laughs> which is a great news story, but, like, um, I feel like there's more pressing issues in the world. <laughs> there's always more pressing issues than we probably see in what's in the daily news. We probably haven't heard about what's going on in Kosovo and Serbia today where tensions are higher there because of a license plate issue. Um, it's possible that the war in Tigray might start again in Ethiopia. And the war's been going on, but relative to the first couple of weeks, less stuff is happening that's of interest per day. There's less developments per day. Things are beginning to solidify. And I think what Putin is banking on is that the West will eventually kind of lose interest. If that happens, that would definitely play in his favor. In general, um, interest, especially amongst American and, and uh, foreign affairs, has, has been historic, you know, is, is, is lower than almost any other category uh, as far as just demand or interest amongst consumers for uh, anything international. Um, unfortunately, um, and I think there's, you know, at six months, um, the the honeymoon phase of the war, if you will, so, um, is 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 over, and I think uh, the bandwidth of of individuals to follow this, and and now, you know, this might be something that my colleagues can comment on, but, you know, with the, it's not to say that the military op uh, operations day by day are. Um, boring or, or less um, involved than early on, but it's, it's, it's more of a stalemate compared to, to, to some of the earlier operations and, and bombing campaigns. And of course, just the beginning of any war ha has, you know, so especially one with this significance, um, is going to be covered in a very dramatic way. Uh, it's a very, arguably the most significant geopolitical event, um, at, at least in this century, perhaps in, in my lifetime, uh, is, is probably the way that I would describe it. So it warranted a lot of attention. I think that um, many media outlets have, you know, uh, advertising ratings that they have to be concerned about and um, are going to gravitate to where maybe the consumer's interests are going to be. 
There's also been a lot of domestic news in the United States, not to say that the alligator story merits um, the, um, the time in the news that you watch, but it's just my speculation. Sam? No, I, I would agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. You know, the first six months of, of any particular conflict, especially in a mo mobile, you know, very sort of mobile um, viewpoint at the outset, you know, you're going to see a lot of focus, a lot of attention uh, with, with that kind of, of thing. Let's see, better? All right. Um, you know, you're going to see far more focus and, and that kind of idea. And then the pullback that all my colleagues sort of mentioned is going to kind of happen as a result of that, or after that. And, and I think building on, on that also, it's important to differentiate between our American media and West big picture. Um, many areas of Europe, I mean, I watch some, I watch German news at least once a week, and they're still keeping, because again, it also is yeah, what's in, close. Yeah, what's, it's, in, it's in the French press all yeah. the time. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But no, it's the same thing, right? It, because for them, it, it's much closer to home, right? And it's much, it's much more significant. Well, and, and there's obviously the concern, too, of escal escalation, which would directly affect Western Europe much sooner than it would affect mm -hmm. us. And they're getting the, the natural gas price increase that Americans, by and large, are not. So in England, they're predicting an 80% increase in natural gas prices, which were already relatively high compared to American prices. So, Yeah, I was just going to connect that back to the global implications that we've all felt of higher costs for food and, and energy, but in particular in, in Europe, it's, it's a major issue, and I think that's going to be um, potentially crisis levels this, this winter. Um, with the rising costs of, of energy and, and yeah, the, the possibility of famine in, in parts of Africa and, and uh, other parts of the world that um, are reliant on grain exports. So, um, you know, obviously this has a lot of direct implications in, uh, for the people involved in, in Ukraine, um, but the, the global impl implications, I think, you know, another reason why this should be covered in greater detail, it's not to say that it's the only reason for um, higher inflation, but um, it's certainly a, a major contributor to inflation in some of these key areas for energy costs and and food and um, other materials. I mean, I think that uh, you know that that's going to have uh, you know an an incredibly important effect, especially in the fall and in the next six months to come. You know, right? I mean, if if one of the things that we've been stressing is this idea that you know, this broader support of, oh, NATO matters. Great, cool. Uh, you know, if anything, it's proven that, of the, the, the idea that the EU is going to be able to find some common ground on something for, you know, once in a while. That's good. Taking those prices up to that level and taking the potential of that level of food insecurity up causes real potential issues for them to be open to maybe straying away from full throated support for the conflict and the continued supply of the Ukrainian military because the Ukrainian military needs that those supplies from the Americans and from the NATO allies and from the EU in order to really be able to continue to propagate the conflict effectively. If they don't get that, they're in huge trouble. Uh, and the maintenance of a, a positive EU support for the conflict, they're worried about that, absolutely, because that can really affect the, the, the rate of all that stuff being delivered to Ukraine. Piggybacking off of that, um, about a fifth of all globally traded calories go through either Russia or Ukraine. And that means that for Ukraine, because Ukraine is still a, a country with an economy, they're projected to fall about 20% as far as GDP this year, which is catastrophic. They're beginning what appears to be in a financial crisis. Ukraine, yes. Um, Russia is projected to fall about like, I think I read 9 or 10%, which is also big, but it's not 20%. And Ukraine is poorer and it's smaller, and it's obviously being attacked as opposed to Russia. So these are things that Ukraine has to be dealing with as well. They're kind of fighting two fronts. They're fighting a military front, and they're also trying to keep their country solvent. And as far as what grain prices might do, 
it's worth remembering that the Arab Spring happened because of an increase in grain prices in Tunisia, where we might not see this right now, but potentially having prices of food increasing everywhere, because inflation is, it's an international issue at this point. The U.S. is 8% is high, but there's countries that are a lot higher than that out there, where this might have considerable international ramifications all around the world that we might not see today, we might not see next week, we might not even see next year. This might be a conflict that goes on for a long, long time. Yeah, I just would like to reiterate those points. Um, I First, uh, about the consequences of higher food prices and and higher energy prices and the way that that could have on uh, un unrest throughout the world. And I think that's uh, really important to keep your eye on. And then um, I, I've read estimates of upwards of 45% of for Ukraine's economy yeah. could be, um, their, of their 45% of their GDP could be lost in the next year. Um, so you're right, it's a very um, trying, to, they've been very successful and, and maybe that's a good way to transition to this question about what are the successes and failures, like who's winning, who's losing, and how do we kind of assess that at this point? But um, as much as we were all surprised about how well Ukraine has been able to fend off Russia's invasion, um, it's not without costs, um, human costs, and of course the economic costs. So would, would any of you like to kind of try to assess uh, success or failure, who's winning, who's losing, or how we might evaluate that? I think Putin is the biggest loser so far from the moment the war protracted. Um, he, he hasn't achieved his goals. It, the, it's costing him a lot of blood and treasure. Um, it's also costing him stock with China. Um, he's not take, and, and China's studying this very closely and looking at the lessons themselves, they have their, their you know, 2049 goal of, and they, much like Putin sees Ukraine as part of Russia, China sees Taiwan. And they've, they've been talking in their li middle military literature about, you know, if, if we move on Taiwan, we're not going to have this long buildup that broadcasts our move. So they're paying attention to this. And, and obviously if the, if the discussion is fairly negative of the way Russia has acted so far in Ukraine, China's not holding them in high esteem. So I don't think it's helping that, that relationship. Now, on the other hand, the international sanctions um, have forced Russia to really work with China more economically. So it has tightened their economic ties. But again, that's going to be, I think, more to China's benefit than Russia's. Right. Um, so. I think those are those are some of the ramifications so far. I would just add on to that the idea. I think it was I was reading something from the Rand Corporation or what it was that the idea. You know, is it? It's very hard to say. You know, who's winning necessarily? You know, sort of definitively. But I think the phrase they were using, which I think is good, is you know, if we want to have cautious optimism or guarded optimism mm -hmm. when it comes to kind of thinking about Ukraine, uh, you know, that's certainly. Uh, of obviously Putin had clear political objectives, right, at the outset of the war. Whatever this is now has not yet been the achievement of those political objectives. Uh, of, you know, that is, that is a clear failure. Uh, you know, the effect of the sanctions as well, demonstrating a, sort of a clear failure. Um, but that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, mean that Ukraine has won yet uh, by any stretch of the imagination. If we think about objectives, one of Putin's main objectives was to make sure that NATO was stopped, if not decreased in power. Well, that has obviously not happened since Sweden and Finland have joined. At the same time, thinking about Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky has made it very clear that he won't accept an end to the war except with a complete restoration of Ukrainian territory, which includes Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk. And that's not going to happen either because this is one of those things that's difficult to swallow. Crimea doesn't want to be a part of Ukraine anymore. And 
it's tough to get estimates as far as whether Donetsk and Luhansk want to be, but it seems like it's about a 50-50 thing, where if you asked people in Crimea, realistically, I, I know that sometimes Russian elections are not entirely fair, but they truly don't want to be a part of Ukraine anymore. And so in that sense, I don't know, war takes kind of its own way of doing things. It's kind of which one is going to, which one is going to give up on what it truly wanted to fight for first. World War I was like that. You know, many wars are like that, where you begin with these objectives, and over the course of the war, the objectives become utterly unattainable. Or they happen, and the war continues anyway. Think about Afghanistan with getting Osama bin Laden, and then American troops were still there. Anyway, we have a question. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, what are Putin's options now? He's dug himself into a hole, so what... what is he screwed? <laughs> well, he's the premier. He can do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. But I mean, will, the, will this affect his, his regime at all? One of the reasons that we think Putin wanted to take over Ukraine was essentially for imperial Russian ambitions that go back to Catherine the Great, essentially back to 1795 in the third partition, when that part of Ukraine became a part of the imperial Russian state. But more pressing, one of the thoughts is that he's up for re-election in 2024, and he just wanted this off his ledger. Now, Russian elections being Russian elections, who knows what that actually means, but it was clearly something that he had on his long-term agenda that he just wanted done. Nick, you can take the mic. I, I could have sworn I heard somewhere that, um, like, Putin is now, like, has like reinstated himself as pre as a uh, what do they call is it president premier premier they have a president like but it's 2032 or something or 2036 i could have sworn i don't know if that's correct but i heard he made some pass some law that keeps him in, in power for a while well he can create laws that say that he can run for re-election over and over and over again and they can count the votes however they want to so i i don't think anybody realistically thinks that he's going to lose power anytime soon, even with this going on. But I'm going to shut up now. Well, and I think there's, I mean, Russian politics being Russian politics, who's really going to run against him? Because bad things can happen. Accidents. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think what was interesting, though, is, and then to come back to your question, but I think what was interesting was while each of us agreed in that last section about, you know, Russia has, has lost in some ways. None of us actually said Ukraine is winning in, in this. Well, you know, I think in World War II, like January 1941, everybody wrote off the Soviets. They said Hitler was going to take it over, that it was just going to be a part of it. The Russians are really good at bumbling invasions. They do it all the time. But over time, they gain strength. They gain cohesion. Who knows? Russia's five times the country that Ukraine is. It's about five times the economy. It has a very, very large military. Ukraine does not. To say that they've lost is not to understand the Russian soul. This is not how Russia loses wars. Josh? I, I don't know. You know, the idea of, you know, I, I think the question, you know, essentially is, um, is, is Putin, you know, sort of, is the question of Putin sort of done for? Is that the idea here? Is that is Putin screwed, basically? Um, is that kind of what you were, uh, so, you know, sort of, okay. Uh, you know, I, who knows? I mean, it, we'll, we'll see. Uh, you know, Putin <laughs> is sitting on a, you know, it's, this is a conflict where, you know, the, the Americans and the allies want to supply the Ukrainians as much as they possibly can up to the point where it doesn't get escalated into a wider conflict. That's simply the, the, the deal breaker with that. Uh, and so they're going to continue to do that. And for as dictatorial as Putin is, for as repressive as the Russian state is, for as conflicted as it, it is, it's still a superpower with a hell of a lot of weaponry and the ability to drag this out for a really, really, really long time. Uh, 
you know, yes, is there a finite amount of Soviet era uh, artillery shells? Sure, but there's a lot of them sitting around, uh, and they can carry this out for a very, 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 very long time. But to sort of go off of what some of my colleagues were saying with this, you know, I, I, I do think it is prescient to think historically in terms of you know, six months into conflicts, larger sort of European-wide conflicts and sort of where those conflicts were were at uh, and, you know, what we can take from those conflicts six months in, right? So if we look at, let's say, uh, you know, September of 1939 uh, and move ourselves six months into the war in Europe uh, in, in World War II, right, you're not yet at you're not yet at the invasion of France. Uh, you know, you're in the middle of the Sitzkrieg uh, or the phony war uh, where, you know, the British army is sitting there next to the French and they're up against the line with the Germans going, they're, they seem like they're bringing up guns. What do we want to do? Are we just going to kind of hang out? What's going on here? Of, you know, so little had already happened, you know, in, in much had happened in a number of places, but yet in some ways with that war, so, you know, it still had to play itself out so much. Uh, there was still so much to be done, right? If we think about, you know, the American entry into World War II in the six months after Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, if you're talking, you know, May of 1942, right, the operations to invade North Africa haven't even happened yet. There's, you know, there are any number of months yet still to occur, right? Uh, if, you know, this is still a time in which the, the last gasp and the initial Japanese effort for the Philippines is being played out. Uh, didn't end up working well for them, you know, eventually, but that takes two and a half years to get played out. Uh, you know, yes, the Soviets lost the or the Germans lost the Eastern Front in 1941, but that takes a while. Yeah. Um, so you're sort of saying like that there hasn't there you it might still take some more time for some like really like deciding victories to happen. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like some major oh, extreme. Oh yes. Okay. Oh yes. You know, the what I look at is sort of okay. How much stuff has the have the Americans given uh, the Ukrainians? Right. I mean. The Americans gave the it was twenty four billion dollars, right? You know, worth of worth of equipment. That's four times the annual defense budget of Ukraine, right? Uh, you know, you're giving them the the, the H I M A R S, right? The the HIMARS, right? HIMARS. The, the sort of systems, right? They haven't lost any of them yet, right? We haven't yet had to re help replace those for them. Of, you know, it, the, this is really early days. Uh, when it comes to to thinking about the process of of war, right? You know, uh, there is that whole sort of age old thing amongst military historians of you know is war process is war sort of an event. Um, uh, a, a professor of ours at the University of Illinois loves to talk about that all the time. Uh, and this is a very early stage of the process. So back to, to winning and losing and and <laughs> kind of put it, I, I think that it's okay. tough to tell in six months, right? But there's, but that being said, there's been successes. Um, you know, it, just kind of recap some of the things that we've said. The Ukrainian people, U Ukrainian uh, Defense Force, uh, Zelensky, uh, the leader of Ukraine, I think have all been very successful uh, with, the, with the hand that they've been dealt. Um, another uh, angle I'd like to add here: um, about a year ago, the Biden administration was in a was was uh, in the pullout of uh, Afghanistan was looking really really poor, um, and I think many people can agree that that was poor. Um, but yet, this foreign policy, to Josh's point about um, basically providing so much aid to Ukraine and doing everything right up into up and, uh, up until the point of d direct conflict with Russia has been very successful, as much as it, it can be, um, without triggering a direct conflict with Russia. It's, it's a tough needle to thread to try to provide as much lethal aid. That's clearly the number of Russians who have died, essentially at the hands of US 
and other allies' uh, military aid is, I mean, one can draw a clear connection there, yet it hasn't provoked um, an escalation um, on a wider scale that, that you know, one could have envisioned, um, you know, based on some of the threats that Putin has made. So I think that, um, you know, liberalism in the sense of international liberalism, of, of multilateralism and, and strengthening uh, global institutions like the European Union and NATO, uh, it's been referenced the expansion um, of, of NATO with Sweden and Finland, uh, very significant development. Um, so those have been some successes, uh, just to, to name a few. Um, but I think it's clear that at six months, it's, it's very difficult to, to declare any sort of um, overall victory. I, I mean, I, I would say though, you know, yes, absolutely. You know, clearly the, the PR campaign in the West, you know, has been incredibly successful. Uh, of you know, if we looked at those initial weeks of the invasion and everything, right? The uh, the optics surrounding Zelensky, right? The uh, you know, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition, right? Sort of those kinds of things that plays really, really well, uh, and it, it has um, had a real true effect, uh, not just in the U.S. and other other nations in terms of folks putting up flags and that kind of thing, but it has, I think, contributed to the, the international um, financial support that has come to the local mobilization mm -hmm. for the Ukrainian war effort, uh, you know, of where, you know, Ukrainian uh, local organizations uh, and communities are able to kind of draw on that. Uh, for fundraising to be able to get supplies into the Ukraine. Any so we've we've basically I suggested that this war is going to last a long time, and and not trying to make predictions on the specific time period, but. What kind of expectations or concerns or signs of optimism might you have going forward? We have a question, it looks I like. Oh, go ahead. Um, so ha this isn't the start of the conflict, correct? This has been going on since like what, 2018 or something, technically, like the Russian-Ukraine? 2014 is 2014? when okay. Um, okay. Crimea was taken over. So it's been pretty much going on throughout that whole time? Right? Well. Or has it been on and off? It depends on what you mean, I guess. Um, like in European history, there's this Hundred Years' War. It goes on from 1337 to 1453, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a whole bunch of little peace treaties in the middle. So people living at that time didn't think of it as one gigantic war. They thought Okay, it so it's like, it's been pretty much like that, where there's like periods of like conflict and then periods of peace. Sort of. Um, to <laughs> to okay. make this even more confusing, throughout the entire period, there have been... Russian paramilitary organizations called the Wagner Group, um, kind of equivalent to like an American version of Blackwater, maybe something like that. A, a PMC, a private mercenary corporation that's essentially seen as being a, a foreign arm of the Russian government. They've been in Luhansk and Donetsk, these two oblasts on the Far East side, doing operations there. Not exactly a war, but not exactly peace either. Sometimes it's not that real, it's not as easy to say what is peace and what is war. Sometimes there's this gray right, area right. in the middle, I guess. So they're like operatives going yes. in and what are they doing? Like what are they, they're, what's their task? Destabilizing the region, propping up leaders of Don, Donetsk and Luhansk that are separatists, that are kind of pro-Russian, that are seen as being in league with Russia. Oh, okay, so that way they have leverage over that part of the land. Right, it's essentially an area that Ukraine doesn't control, but still a part of Ukraine. Oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. It's a little confusing, but... <laughs> Just a little, yeah. I mean, in that aspect, it's also, from Putin's perspective, right, it's putting down an insurgency. Because right? he sees these small areas as the loyalists, you know, so you said separatists, when his perspective is they're loyalists to Russia, which right. is where they should be, which again makes it a much more convoluted issue, right? Which which side is legitimate? 
um, which side has the right to rule in the region. And uh, that and that can be very contested, and that's where things get quite ugly. And the rise of these these you know uh, PMCs yeah has been a major aspect. I mean, we I think there's at least two thousand um, foreign fighters from different mercenary corporations who've already died over there, um, and there's and there's a number of people who have also you know, volunteered on the American side. I mean, I think there's also uh, coming from America to support the Ukrainian side. Um, and, and, you know, in ways, I think there's, the, with these historical analogies that we've been throwing around, I think there's also an analogy to the Spanish Civil War because you, see, you saw the various sides that would eventually square off in World War II, essentially backing different factions there. Um, and at the same time, you know, in a, in a very sort of cold-blooded sense, testing out some of their e equipment and doctrine without actually getting involved directly. Um, and, and that certainly is going on from the NATO side. Um, so far, China hasn't given anything to Russia. They're, they might be actually one of the bigger winners in this so far. They because, absolutely are. Yeah, economically, their doctrine, their training, their thoughts, their plans for for t Taiwan have all been sort of enhanced out of this. Long term, um, Russia has a net fertility of 1.5, which means that every woman on average will give birth to one and a half kids. You need two for a population to sustain itself, so Russia is very much losing population before the war already. There's about 35 million people in Russian North Asia, everything east of the Urals. So 35 million over there. China, on the other hand, has 150 million in Manchuria alone. So they've got five times the population over there, and they're moving over. And a lot of people are questioning whether or not in Russia, as well as in other places, if Putin's essentially giving up Siberia to China to attempt to regain Ukraine. These are long-term questions, though. Long-term, Russia may not be able to keep any sort of a population in Siberia at all. This might be another way that, that China gains more import and more power in North Asia. I don't know. Also, just one last thing. Uh, speaking about legitimacy and separatists, it's worth remembering once again that like Putin doesn't view the country of Ukraine as legitimate at all. He doesn't make sense of them as being a country. He makes sense of them as being a historical error that he's correcting. And I'll shut up. Sorry. Are there any other questions from the audience? So I had asked earlier about kind of expectations going forward, um, it, it, potentially signs of optimism, signs of concern or expectations, you know, again, not making predictions of how long the war is going to last, but um, maybe just what you might expect to see going forward? Um, I mean, I think that there, in terms of things that we expect to see, there's, there's certainly positives and, and there's great difficulty. Um, I, I think the war has taken, as, as any conflict does, a, a devastating toll on the Ukrainian civilian population, especially women. Uh, and it has, in the essentially levee en masse, you know, of mobilization that the Ukrainian nation is now having to do in order to try to meet this conflict, you know, relied heavily on the labor of those women. Uh, in many cases, and so I think that's one of the things that we're going to continue to see uh, is a transformation of the the roles of women in Ukraine uh, and real violence there. I think uh, the continued idea of grassroots mobilization uh, we're also going to see. Uh, you know, um, I was reading the other day about a, a group called the Ukrainian Volunteer Service. Uh, and it was this young woman who's like 26, 
uh, and you know, she had done a study abroad in the U.S. Uh, in high school and got inspired by the idea of community service. Uh, and then she comes back, and the war starts, and now her and a number of her friends are running this thing to meet volunteer needs for a couple hundred thousand Ukrainians. Uh, you know, th you're going to see that kind of, of thing, uh, you know, where they're relying a lot on, on sort of international support and international funding and sort of that kind of thing. Um, so I think there's going to be real trials and difficulties, but also a strong reliance on the labor of many that often goes unseen. A part of me, when I, I think about what seems like the most possible outcome of a great many outcomes that are definitely possible, when you look at the way that Ukraine has functioned for a long time, essentially the Western half of the country has voted for pro-EU leaders, for pro-Western leaders. They have a Western outlook. And the Eastern half of the country has voted for pro-Russian leaders. It's been like that with Kuchma and Kravchuk. It's been like that with Yanukovych and Timoshenko. It's been like that for election over election over election. You can kind of think of it as far as like the U.S. where the northern half votes one way, the southern half votes another way, except much more dire and in a much more contrasting state. And I can't help but notice that if you take a look at a map of Ukraine today, it's the eastern half that's getting taken over and the western half that's not. Some of that is obviously because that's where Russia's military is. But Russia also has a military force in Transnistria, which is in the eastern half of Moldova. They've made no attempts to take over the western half. I can't help but wonder if that's a part of Putin's plan, to separate the country into essentially two halves, creating kind of a, an eastern Ukrainian state that would be much more pro-Putin in mind and essentially giving up the western half. When I look at the map, it seems like the Dnieper River is essentially where that half takes place. The western half is much less Russianized. It's much less likely to speak Russian. The eastern half are Ukrainians, but most speak Russian. Most Ukrainians do speak Russian. And I can't help but wonder if that's what this is going to look like 10, 15, 20 years from now. Either a very federated state or being one that's essentially split in two one being a Russian puppet state or being heavily dominated by Russian political atmosphere and by one that's essentially been given up. And I don't know. It's That would make sense as far as why there was the pullback in the north, but I, I couldn't say. Even in Moldova, they're wondering about that because Moldova's looking, Moldova's a former Soviet republic as well. They have a separatist state, much the way that Donetsk and Luhansk do. And they're wondering if at some point, if the same thing that happened in Ukraine is going to happen to them. And they've been wondering this for months now, but apparently in the last two weeks, the topic has become more heated as the premier of Moldova, Maya Sandu, she's looked to gain EU approval to get into the European Union. But I don't know. And I think that's actually a, a circumstance that's making its way around the, the former Soviet-dominated states, right? Moldova, Estonia, everyone is prepared, you know, everybody's worried that they're going to be next. Um, on the, I think there is a possibility, there's a couple of possibilities, you know, um, a partition Ukraine, um, there is also the possibility that, you know, the value of the object just isn't worth it. And as premier, Putin can pull out um, and doesn't have to worry. And again, you know, we had a military pullout last year after a long and bloody commitment. And we haven't had an internal revolution here. Now, granted, we have a political system where we can sort of have a soft revolution every four years, should we so choose, and that, but that, and that mollifies a lot of that sentiment. But and it's also, you know, people were up in arms. I was talking to uh, people who had served in Afghanistan and and were extremely upset. But now it's kind of faded off the radar. 
you know, a, literally a year later. So it, I don't think it's it's I don't think that would be the thing to make Putin fall. Should he decide at some point that you know this just isn't worth it to me at this juncture, um, and decide to pull out? Uh, and and at the same time, you know, as as repressive as his regime has been, um, there the bright spot to me in all of this is he is in fact mortal, and hmm. you know it's and the problem with dictators such as such as Vladimir Putin is, they're usually not grooming a successor because that successor in turn becomes a rival. And so that's not part of the plan. So I, I think that any of these changes that may or may not occur aren't going to be set in stone should they happen. There's always, there's always the opportunity. You know, pe peace is never final. There's always the chance that, that even a partitioned Ukraine somewhere in the future might opt for reunification. And Putin, there's always questions about how healthy he is, it seems like. Yeah. Frequent rumors about that. Yeah, yeah I, think, uh, I, I think that partition model of, of Ukraine is one that is a, a distinct possibility, but yet you also, and I think I agree with your point that you made earlier, that it's hard to imagine Ukraine um, letting that happen or agreeing to that. And it's hard to imagine Russia um, falling short of that. Of, of, and so, you know, I think one prediction is, is just how long this could really last. And I think Nick had asked a question earlier about the first, the difference between media coverage initially and at the six month mark. Well, wait for this war, if this war does continue for years, uh, similar to the way that we saw it happen in Afghanistan, uh, although that was a much smaller uh, military endeavor by the United States. At most points, the, the the media coverage fell off so dramatically. There was only a few stories on it the last several years, um, and despite that, yeah, Jim's right. There was a huge amount of blowback internally about the way that that exit withdrawal from Af Afghanistan took place. So, one of the concerns I have is as media attention fades and as our interest, uh, general interest around the world, especially the West world, fades is what happens to support for Ukraine, what, what happens when potentially gas prices, energy prices really skyrocket. There doesn't seem to be a huge appetite for paying some of the secondary level implication burdens that we do when it comes wartime around the world. Uh, there's been a lot of complaints, and, and not to say that this is the only reason for high gas prices, high food prices, and inflation, but it's certainly a, a major contributing factor. And I, I, I really worry, especially in Europe, and I think that Putin might think that some of the um, support amongst uh, allies, uh, whether it be in Germany or the United Kingdom, um, it might be less supportive as this wears on and as gas prices, energy prices uh, uh, go, go even higher. Um, but there's a lot of potential things to be concerned about. It's hard to identify all of them. So I appreciate so far what we've been able to identify. Other questions, comments from the audience? I don't know, there was um, maybe just a comment or so. We have a, about uh, a, a few minutes left uh, about logistics, the way that um, supplying the forces uh, in Ukraine or of, of Russia, the way that that's played out. Any comments that you can make on um, the significance of logistics? I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, I think that, you know, it's been interesting to see the manner in which uh, conversations around uh, American and NATO military capacities have been from the, the beginning of the war and then now six months into the war in terms of what the Ukrainians had at the start of it, what we've supplied them with, and sort of how um, you know they're sort of going to be able to continue to be resupplied. You know, much of the initial conversation was often around things like, well, you know, we need to bring in aircraft or sort of a no-fly zone, you know, sort of all those kinds of things. And then initially it was, well, we just need to give the Ukrainians a whole bunch of stuff and that's going to be great. The difficulty, of course, being, you, you know, 
okay, you want to give the Ukrainians 500 M1A1 Abrams. Okay, well, what if one of the tank tracks break? Uh, or, you know, uh, do you have an M1 Abrams repair shop there? I mean, yes, I recognize that Ukraine has a lot of resources, be it agricultural, and they're the, um, you know, the only place that produces aircraft carriers for Russia. Uh, however, uh, most of what they had was earlier Soviet kind of stuff. Uh, and so the process and conversation around logistics now um, has been a sort of <coughs> hybrid model of transitioning towards uh, the supply chains of the partners of NATO. Uh, and how do you do that amidst a war uh, in an effective way? Uh, because the other part of that is not just the process of getting the stuff in, which I'm thinking of sort of two, in, two or three interesting sort of things where, you know, some of the getting stuff in actually involves going to Poland, picking it up, and bringing it back over, uh -huh. uh, which a lot of that's being done by women, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, for some of the units, it's that process of how do you bring folks off the line to train them up on something new and then get them back out? Uh, and then, you know, how do you um, do that while also still maintaining effectiveness on the line itself? So, you know, I think the logistics process when it comes to all of this is a really interesting process that, you know, needs to be focused on, you know, kind of as we go forward. Well, oh, you had a question? That yeah, actually sorry. goes right into my question. Um, yeah. I was just going to ask each of you uh, what you're looking out for for the next, like, six months of the war. But you said logistics is logistics, yeah. interesting For me, thing, at least, yeah. But I don't and know. The for the rest of you? I'm looking to see some potential change in what might be objectives, I guess. Right now, Putin's stated objectives are not possible. They're not achievable. Zelensky's objectives are probably not achievable either. So which side is going to say maybe that they're willing to compromise and accept less of what they would think of to potentially achieve victory? And I don't know. I don't think a peace treaty is coming in six months. This this no. might be the kind of war that we're talking about for decades. This, but then again, I don't know. I If you asked me in January of 2022, is this going to turn into a war? I'd be like, no, no, no way. So I, I have no idea what could happen. And I'm refreshingly open to ideas on, on these things. For my part, for the next six months, I would be keeping my eye out for a shift to more irregular warfare on the part of Ukraine, because that's mm -hmm. the way they can, that would tend to be the way they can draw this out, and the longer it draws out, see, I, I don't think that the longer it lasts, it's going to benefit Russia. I think the longer it lasts, it's really going to, to bleed Russia white in all sorts of ways, economically, politically. Um, and, you know, we keep talking about one of the things that, that, that I think this has changed the most for a lot of people is we've talked about this vaunted Russian army and this huge Russian army. It stinks. It really hasn't yep. accomplished what it, it. If it's that great, they should have already won. Exactly. And, and so it really, that's a problem. It's not that's a discussion. A, yeah, yeah, they, they it, should a, have won already, <laughs> and they haven't. And it right. looks really bad. Which, which has ramifications all over the map for Putin's regime. You know, if, if you're banking on this idea that you've got this great military machine and then we're seeing it in action and going, okay, where is it? You know, um, that, again, like I was saying earlier, China's not as, China's not as, you know, the unlimited alliance seems to have some very clear limits on it these days. Um, so I, I think that this, uh, if this protracts and, and does go to, it's going to get really, really ugly. Um, but I think that, it, you know, Russia is, and again, you've got to look at, in the end, the value of the object. What's it worth? How much is it going to be worth? And all sorts of other variables would come into play at that point. You know, Putin's health. Um, who takes power after Putin? And when you're the new regime, you can do all kinds of things and, and literally throw out a lot of the old regime's strategic objectives if it wins you popularity, in the sh even in the short or, or intermediate term, and do all sorts of things. 
uh, that are different because you don't have the baggage attached to it that the old regime did. So I think past that six months point, it really does become sort of a, a question mark of what could happen. But that's what I'm going to have my, that's what I'm going to be looking for in the next six months or so. Yeah, I would go back to the comment I made earlier about the ability for there to be resolve amongst the West, the United States, Germany, and others as inflation and, and um, energy prices, potentially food prices, stay high, and um, potentially a new Congress in the United States. Um, if Republicans take the House of Representatives, how much support there will be for continued war funding when there's a lot of resources, uh, some who would, who would argue resources shouldn't be spent abroad um, maybe there'd be less um, commitment to Ukraine. And um, just all the, the potential ways that this could go sideways. I think we've been very lucky so far. As, as bad as this war has been, it, there hasn't been direct conflict between the United States uh, and Russia, uh, or, or between Russia and major powers in the, in the European Union. And just uh, hopefully, yeah, it's, how, how, how many different ways that this could go off the rails. And so hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but I think there's, there's definitely a strong chance that there's a, lo uh, a lot of different ways that this could, could go sideways. So that's something I'm gonna keep an eye on. And, and even some of the um, assassination attempts and, and things like that that could happen and domestic unrest in, in Russia and as people become perhaps upset with the way that the war is dragging on or if they have to go to uh, bringing more uh, military personnel, you know, draft type things and in, in, into where some of the elite, uh, ch the children of the elite might have to play um, soldiers and, and the way that that could happen and uh, the implications that that could have in Russia. Excuse me. And also, I mean, we, we brought up China earlier, but the way that the role that they could have um, it will also be interesting to keep for the next six months. So, other comments and questions? I think your thought on the assassinations is really important because in the last couple of weeks, so Putin's got this kind of resident philosopher, Alexander Dugin, and his daughter, Daria Dugina, was assassinated. And that's something that, I don't know if we've seen the ramifications for that yet. In the back of my mind, too, I it would be horrible if this were to happen, but Putin's obsessed with nuclear weapons. That's why he's so concerned about Chernobyl, Chernobyl in Russian, or Zaporizhia. Uh, what would happen if Ukraine got a nuclear weapon? That's chilling. And that's the reason that we're in this conflict right now anyway, because the Budapest Accord signed in, I think, 93, Ukraine dismantled its nuclear arsenal. And if they didn't do that, they wouldn't be invaded right now. I just have a quick question. Um, who did you say Putin's advisor? What was his name? Alexander Dugin. Dugin? Um, he's Dugin, D-U-G-I-N. Um, he's kind of like Putin's oh, philosopher, you. I guess, in a sort of way. Dugin... His works have never really been translated much into English, but his big book was in 1997 called The Geopolitics of Nations. And in it, he kind of stresses this idea that Americans will understand pretty well. It's this idea that Russia has this unique destiny. And its destiny is that it's a non-Western country. It's an illiberal one. It's one that's not secular. It's one where LGBT rights are not to be accepted. It's this one that's essentially alone against a Western bulwark. And Putin really liked the guy. And apparently his works have been read extensively in kind of the higher circles, potentially forced to be read among his officer staff. <coughs> and so he was kind of the architect of the 2014, <clears throat> sorry, I got something caught in my throat, the 2014 annexation of Crimea. So, yeah, I hope his works get translated into English better. My Russian is my Ruski Plokhoi. It's real bad. There was a uh, New York Times, the Daily uh, podcast, uh, did a segment last week 
on that assassination and, and kind of looking at the implications and potential who could have done it or who had motives and be interesting to check out if you get an opportunity. All right, well, thank you for your attendance in our event today. I want to thank uh, Tara and Troy again and the library staff for hosting us. First uh, live event in two and a half years. And, and of course, thank my panelists for volunteering their time and expertise to be here uh, this afternoon. So thank you to Professor King and McIntyre and Fulton. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.